Hello, this is Harry Watt with North Carolina State University Wood Products Extension. I'm with Jonathan Kays of the Western Maryland Research and Education Center near Hagerstown, Maryland. This is the National Firewood Workshop 2021. Hey, Jonathan. Hey, hello from uh, near Hagerstown, Western Maryland. There you go, great place. We hosted the 2015 <clears throat> National 16. Firewood Workshop, huh? 2016. 16. Yeah, okay. Anyway, we had the greatest time and we hope to come back sometime. Right. We talked about that in another session. Uh, it was good, good turnout, well received, and actually had hopes out of that of trying to do, kind of develop a firewood association. But uh, uh, just we did some uh, follow up to that, but we just told the other responsibilities, just couldn't really commit the time to it. So um, anyway. <laughs> well, we're today going to talk about moisture content and drying firewood time. So take it away, Jonathan. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to share my screen. Well, you know, one of the questions we have is, uh, you know, it's about how long does it take to dry wood? And, um, and also, you know, a lot of people will, um, you know, cut wood into rounds, for example. And then, you know, they'll say, uh, they'll go back later and then, you know, split it and burn it. So, you know, what's the effect, the difference between just cutting wood into rounds and letting it dry and actually splitting it and letting it dry? You know, what, what's the difference in moisture? Uh, how long does that take? So, we, you know, we had some wood out here. Uh, actually, a lot of this wood came from the, uh, uh, I think, I actually, I, I can't remember, but I think a lot of this was done because we had wood left over from the, uh, from the firewood workshop. That, now that I think about it, that's where the wood came from. I, that didn't even slip my mind. So we put some of this together into a fact sheet and uh, I'll just kind of go over briefly some of the results. Uh, we didn't have any oak, you know, so, uh, which is, but you know, there was some other locusts that might be compared to that. So, so let's just take a look and um, uh, see where we are here. And uh, so this is a fact sheet and it's on our website. Um, at, extent, at uh, go.umd.edu slash woodland. Now I'll take you to our forestry website and uh, if you look under publications under wood, energy and stuff, you'll find this. But you know, the idea was to measure wood moisture. And I'm gonna move my camera over here so we can, I can look directly at you and um, see uh, you know, about measuring wood. And you know, there's a lot of different ways to measure wood moisture by looking at you know, the checking in the end Obviously, if you don't have that, you know that you, it's not very dry, but uh, we have, are always looking for kind of a, you know, a target of about 20% moisture, and that's internal moisture. And uh, I, I'm a definite believer in using these wood moisture meters. I have actually both these meters. Uh, they vary a little bit, you know, um, but they're both pretty good. Uh, they cost around $25, $30 if you buy them online or a lot of, a lot of wood shops you know, wood retailers will sell them, um, you know, uh, that are selling wood stoves. And the idea is to take the wood uh, moisture in the middle of the wood, you know, so the outside is always gonna be drier than the internal. So we're really interested in a 20% internal. And uh, that's what uh, that we use with this technique here. And uh, I recommend everybody, you know, get one of these. And you can see how we were measuring wood here. We took a piece of wood, split it, and then measure it in the middle. That's where we want to get, uh, ideally, get that to about 20%. And for anybody buying wood, uh, before they unload it off the truck, <laughs> you know, as I recommend doing this so that if they're advertising that as seasoned wood, which is seasoned wood is 20% internal moisture, um, you know, I recommend they, they do this first because it may be a point of negotiation. I'm not saying you turn the wood away, but you know, if the wood moisture is like 25, 30%, you got some drying time uh, before that wood can really be uh, burned well. And of course we know, you know, wetter wood is gonna give you less heat, but it's also gonna cause problems with, you know, creosote and other types of, uh, you know, deposits in your chimney. So um, uh, this, is, this is one of the moisture meters. They both have, some, one of them has two prongs, the other has four prongs, um, so, use them. So we wanted to answer the question here about, um, you know, drying time for some different hardwood species that we had access to. 
Uh, most of these were 12 to, inches, 18, 12 to 18 inches in diameter, um, and they were cut, it says mid-April 2016. So these were cut literally days before the 2016 uh, Firewood National Firewood Workshop, which was in April. And I remember cutting these trees down and then hauling them over there. Um, so we, you know, we wanted to compare um, uh, taking different moisture measurements and as well as if the wood was actually cut into rounds or if it was split first, all right? And uh, we put them on pallets and stuff like that and took some regular measurements. And uh, this is, you know, we actually graphed it. So what you see here on the the figure five on the top left there, and I'll, let me see if I can, yeah, probably get that a little better. Um, this was for all the species. We had cherry, hickory, locust, and hackberry. So again, you know, I think oak would be pretty close to hickory probably, um, uh, for sure, maybe even locust, but definitely hickory, very tight wood. And you can see that we started taking measurements on 42716, that's April 27th. And what we did is about every, you know, every few weeks or every couple, you know, every month or two, uh, we would go in, I would select some species, we'd split the you know, pieces of wood. Let me get my camera back and focus here. Okay, for some reason this camera just wants to uh, sometimes, well, hopefully it will come back. <laughs> okay, uh, since we're looking at the, uh, the shared screen anyway. Um, and you can see we go to we go to um, June, uh, you know July, August, and then we basically go about a year is what it is. So we end up almost a year later in April, mid April of 2017. And you can see that the drying, the, the amount of drying goes down. We started off. Let's just look at the um, uh, the cherry, which dries pretty quick. Okay, it started off around you know 20. 7, 28%, had a little mix and bumps here. And this was the combination of a number of measurements. We took a couple of different uh, uh, measurements on different pieces and then combined and got the averages and so on. And you can see we were down to 17% within a year, okay? Uh, which, was, which was pretty good. Um, and then also, uh, but when you look at hickory, again, starting off around uh, 30, 31%, Actually, going a little higher. It's just you know because of the way you know the sampling area, but it did start to dry out. But after a year, we were only down to twenty five percent. And you know most people will tell you that for oak, uh, you need at least a year, probably closer to a year and a half, maybe. And if you consider oak similar to hickory, I would agree with that. That definitely needs some more drying time. The other species there were locust. Uh, the locust actually dried down to close to twenty percent. Um, and hackberry, which many people don't have, you know, it's kind of a species here. It grows on a lot of these, you know, limestone outcrops and stuff. Uh, that dried out pretty good. So the other graphs just show the actual, um, uh, you know, specific measurements for each species. So, for example, the graph on the right, let me go down to cherry here, okay? Uh, drawing time for black cherry. And this was taking measurements three measurements, okay, or, or the internal measurements and then near the end of the log, okay? So the average moisture here is the green and the blue line um, was taking the actual measurement, split the, the piece of wood, taking the measurement exactly in the middle of the piece of wood, you know, where it would be the hardest to dry. And then the average is near the end. So that would dry out before the, in, the, the center of the piece of wood. So you do see some real differences, uh, you know, later on. Um, so the, uh, the average moisture was around 17%, but the actual internal measurement was still around 21%, which isn't bad. But the, the end was actually off the graph here. It's probably around 17%. So it just makes the point that the way wood dries is it dries from the outside in as it you know, it's exposed to all that surface area. The wood is kind of a, through capillary actions being sucked out of the wood. And the last part, the hardest part to dry is the center of a piece of wood. But that's ideally what we would like to be seasoned wood, which would be around 20%. So 
Uh, that's the reason <laughs> when you sample a piece of wood uh, with a moisture meter is that you split it and you measure it in the, in, you know, in the, in the internal, right, in the, in the center of the piece of wood. Uh, a couple other things just worth mentioning. Um, um, I didn't hear have an actual, I guess I didn't have actual graphs here, um, uh, but I did have some rounds of wood. Um, uh, I'm not sure why I don't see that here, um, but uh, maybe I didn't report on that, but we did find that the, the pieces that were in rounds uh, were actually, um, uh, did, didn't dry that much at all. The internal moisture of those, of those rounds were, was stayed extremely high after a period of a year. So it just proves the point that, you know, you really want to split the wood to get it to dry. And um, uh, so uh, that's, that's kind of where we are right now. Um, and in terms of a couple of conclusions, um, you know, well-seasoned wood is going to give you a lot more heat, a lot more BTUs. You can have a lot more pro less problems with deposits in your chimney. And uh, I think that's important. Um, there's a couple of things here that you may want to consider since, you know, the moisture in, inside the actual growing tree changes over the course of the year as well. So come, you know, spring, you know, you know, moisture is coming out of the roots basically coming up into the tree. So if you're gonna cut wood, the best time to cut it when there's less moisture in the tree would be you know, late summer, fall and early winter because you know, a lot of the, the storage is going into the roots and the trees are more dried out. In fact, uh, for timber cutters that cut high quality hardwoods, they like to wait until fall and, and you know, winter to really cut that timber because there's going to be a lot less moisture and there's a lot less chance there's going to get uh, staining in the wood because, you know, staining in the wood comes from, uh, you know, fungus that gets, or bacteria and stuff that gets in through the water in the tree and then it kind of, you know, forms colorations and stuff so that you don't want that in quality timber. Uh, you know, build a woodshed. If you're building a woodshed, you know, don't enclose the wood. Um, you want to cover it on the top so the water doesn't fall on through the top, but you want the free flow of water. And, you know, a lot of people um, uh, will have a, like an old barn or something, uh, like an old shed, and they'll fill it full of wood. And if you're going to do that, you really need to take out the sides of the shed because you need the flow of air through it. Um, if you can elevate your wood off the ground or have a layer of plastic underneath uh, for obvious reasons, uh, so it doesn't stay moist down there. And if possible, um, I didn't really... Uh, measure this to document this, but it's always good if you can locate uh, your drying wood pile where you have full sunlight. Um, and and uh, because you're gonna, you know, that that wood, that sun beating down is gonna, it's gonna be that's you know, aid the drying process along as if there's good circulation. So it's gonna take at least a year typically to dry wood satisfactorily. And for some of these harder woods like oak and hickory and things, you know, I would count on a year and a half. And of course, if you have your moisture meter, um, you'll know when that's going to be. And here's just a couple of pictures of some different sheds. The sheds come in all kinds. So um, anyway, that's uh, that was the results of the, the study we had. And uh, I guess I have to thank the uh, the fact that we decided to put on the National Firewood Workshop because I never would have had that wood otherwise. And I will tell you that after the study was over, uh, most of that wood found it into my wood stove. So. <laughs> well, that's the rule that we say for the National Firewood Workshop is whoever brings the logs for demos gets to keep the wood. Exactly. And, and you definitely earned it. Uh, one thing I noticed looking at the graphs is I think this wood barely got seasoned enough. I mean, I, I would like to have it, you know, yeah. some of it's just barely got, got, barely got there. Yeah, look at the hickory. This is the graph for hickory, right? Uh, for, you know, the internal, external. And you can see that it was based barely, it, it really wasn't dried at all. It wasn't dried sufficiently at all. Well, I know some firewood producers don't like doing oak and hickory. Uh, they get much quicker drying with the maples, <coughs> the cherries, and the other species. And another question people get into is when you do a, fire, a full truckload of bundle wood, 
uh, know one guy that likes to slip in a couple pieces of poplar in every bundle just to lighten the load for the whole truck. Yeah. Well, and in, in fact, and you've seen these graphs that there's a big difference in the amount of BTUs per cord by species. So if you're buying wood by the cord, it makes a big difference, okay? Because, you know, I think a cord of wood, red oak has like 24 million BTUs or something like that. You know, you get down into like some of your cherry and some of the other stuff, you know, you're down into, I don't know, 16 and, you know, you're, you're basically getting maybe 25 or 30% less BTUs out of a cord of wood by buying oak or buying, uh, you know, cherry or and poplar or some of that stuff's even lower. But, you know, we actually have a fact sheet and, and that, all that information is easily available about the BTUs per cord uh, by species. Yeah, but the other thing people have to remember, and you know it for for fact, that the difference between the green wood BTUs and the dry wood is almost three times. So there's a trade-off. If you don't let your hard hardwoods dry long enough, even though they're denser, you're going to not get the BTUs that you might get from a, another wood that dries faster. It's it's all paying attention to getting that wood dry. Yeah, and uh, that's you know all these efficiencies all these new stoves are great but uh and i will tell you you know if, for anybody who's has like an outdoor wood burner uh you know the new regulations that the stoves that they sell now uh, are much more efficient but uh, you you can't they're not like the old outdoor wood burners where you can throw in big pieces of wood and cow carcasses and <laughs> everything else i mean you got to burn you got to, you have to use um seasoned wood. And in fact, if you don't, uh, they'll go out. And, and like, I know that um, some, some of the stove companies, Central Boiler, they have an optional gas igniter. So that, and, and the reason it's there is because people trying to burn wet wood, they'll actually have to, you know, you actually have to use gas to reignite the stove. And it's actually, it's, it's actually, it has a significant cost to that add-on, which is interesting. So uh, uh, people that are used to you know, buying these outdoor wood boilers have a rude awakening uh, with the type of wood that they'll burn now. Right. But, but there again, they'll burn a third or half as much wood. Uh, the, the new ones that are the gasifiers, the town drafts, they are really tremendous stoves. Well, and, and, and the, old, the old wood stoves, pre-EPA wood stoves, you know, pre-1988, you know, wood stoves were not certified by EPA. So... I mean, you still see them around Fisher, Timberline, in people's homes. It's basically a box with a, a flu, okay? They're maybe like, what, 30% efficient. So if you go and then you buy even one of the stoves after 1988, they had to be 7.5 grams per uh, particulates per hour. They're still 60% or more efficient. When you figure the math, you're going to burn half as much wood. So the question is, what is your time worth to you? So Oh, okay. I got all the wood I need. Well, why should I, you know, have to harvest and process twice as much wood when if I just buy a new stove and season the wood, I'm going to burn a whole lot less wood and save myself a whole lot, whole lot of time. Well, we have the new uh, tax incentive now. I think it's 26 <clears> percent <throat> includes the stove, the installation and the uh, you know, the labor. So it's an un unbelievably good time to buy a new stove. Well, Maryland has had a residential wood grant program now for a number of years. And they'll pay up to $700 for a pellet stove or for a clean burning wood stove, but it has to be to meet the new requirements for EPA, which were updated in 2015. And that's like 2.3 or two grams of particulates per hour. And there's a lot of the wood stoves have a hard time meeting that standard. Pellet stoves don't, but so you can get seven hundred dollars, and that could be that's put towards the uh, the purchase price. Well, and, thanks for talking to us today about firewood yeah. and moisture and drying times, and uh, we'll visit again. Okay, National Firewood Workshop twenty twenty one. Good thanks. luck. Take care.